looking at Tozer, we think about so often people not doing enough. Or we think about ourselves not doing all that we could. Sometimes I think we forget that there are those who actually not only do all they can, but probably do too much. They possibly extend themselves out so far, so often, that they get into a routine of religious activity. And sometimes they don't take the time for themselves that they need to rejuvenate or to restore their soul, to lift up their spirits, to be ministered to as opposed to ministering to others. I know for the longest time I used to minister to ministers, basically, is that I would always watch and see the men of God that needed some encouraging or some exhortation or some way of helping them in some way that nobody else noticed. You know, that I could do something anonymously and behind the scenes that would help them and mean something to them that was important. And I think in seeing that and recognizing that men of God, no matter who they are, lots of times they need to be encouraged in some way because they each one have a personal walk but likewise if they're in ministry they have a personal challenge to always recognize their part and God's part you know there's a part of them in ministry that they have to do that is the, the you could call it the grunt work of it you know some of the things that are practical that we do in our society that maybe are technological or or maybe personally ministerial, meaning that you talk to a person face to face. And while the Holy Spirit may give you the gift and abilities at the time that you're talking to the person, when you're done, the emotional drain kind of wears you out. It's kind of like that song that says, uh, The Warrior is a Child, you know, that a uh, Christian artist wrote a long time ago. I think sometimes we need to recognize that at times in ministry it is taking out of you a lot and that you do need that opportunity to have time for your personal time with God and you know it's nice to say that especially if you're in ministry that you take the time to you know be, be alone you know you've got your prayer time or your reading time or your Bible time whatever but really that doesn't cut it you know there's something more about that balance between ministry and being ministered to, that you have to find some place, somehow, some way, that works for you. You know, someone talked to me recently and said uh, that they didn't want to interrupt me, but uh, they knew that I took some time off, and I said, well, not really. <laughs> I said, actually, I just keep going, you know, I mean, I'll admit there's maybe, a, I think, a week in August or maybe summer sometime. I don't know if it's August or whenever, but we always take off and go somewhere camping, you know, so we, I literally just get away from everything, you know, I don't, I don't do anything except, you know, really alone with God, you know, kind of a camp out where we just go to some uh, woody area that, you know, we like going to, and it's away from everyone and anyone, and we don't see anybody, and we just veg out. We do absolutely zero. And it's really a time of just kind of like rejuvenation. It's almost like a, uh, I think in the old King James way or in the old English way, they used to call it a, a uh, sabbatical. That's the word. They would, especially people that were in universities or in schooling or in education where they poured out so much of themselves, they would take this sabbatical, you know, time off to be alone with themselves, to catch up with themselves, so to speak, or to kind of connect with themselves. Because there's so much giving that they don't receive, so they need to do things for themselves. And I think sometimes that in ministry we don't 
really get that in the modern day because there's so much of this idea that we're living every day in a ministerial way that you forget that in the Old Testament, people like Abraham had moments where God spoke to them, not every day God dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis. They had long periods of time where there was no activity, seemingly so, and that they had to deal with the everyday occurrences of life according to the wisdom that they'd already been given. And sometimes, maybe that should be an encouragement to you that when you think you don't measure up or you do measure up and you think that you have to always be out there constantly doing something, recognize that God is the only one who can be constantly doing things. We're just responding to Him. We're in fellowship with Him. We're walking with Him. The fact that we share that or we relate that to other people in a ministry way is just simply an after effect, not the primary effect of our relationship with God. It should be secondary to our relationship with God. The primary should be spending time alone with Him and enjoying Him for who He is. High privilege, God counts as His friends. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and he was called the friend of God. James 2, 23. The image of God in man cannot extend to every part of man's being. For God has attributes which he cannot impart to any of his creatures, however favored or however special they are. God still has parts of himself that is only God. God is uncreated. He is self-existent. He is infinite. He is sovereign. And he is eternal. These attributes are his alone and by their very definition cannot be shared with another. But there are other attributes which he can impart to his creatures and in some measure share with his redeemed children. Intellect, self-consciousness, love, goodness, holiness, pity, faithfulness. These and certain other attributes are the points where the likeness between God and man may be achieved. It is here that the divine human friendship is experienced in God imparting his quality in us to make us of his nature and not our own. God being perfect has capacity for perfect friendship. He is the ultimate perfect friend of God, of man. Man being imperfect can never quite know perfection in anything. As a matter of fact, in everything he's likely to fail. Least of all in his relationship to the incomprehensible Godhead. The more perfect our friendship with God becomes, the simpler will our lives be. Those formalities that are so necessary to keep a casual friendship alive may be dispensed with when true friends sit in each other's presence. True friends trust each other. Unquestionably, the highest privilege granted to man on earth is to be admitted into the circle of friends of God. Nothing is important enough to be allowed to stand in the way of our relationship to God. We should see to it that nothing on earth shall separate us from God's friendship. You know, that's so true, too, that when I was a child, I spoke as a child and I reasoned as a child would. And I did many things that, as a child of God, I would do, you know, and recommend for those that are learning, you know, to walk with God to do, you know studying and memorization and you know being formal and you know learning certain things but at some point in time you become kind of communion with God you become at one with God where you kind of share your heart and he shares his with yours and you feel less so formal and more so intimate than most others might understand or comprehend and so you get that opportunity if you pursue it you know, as you do that with which you need to grow there in, in religious life, you suddenly become to a place where it's more of a relationship life of just God blesses you, God fills you, God lives in you. And sometimes that's what is more important in ministry, is just the fact that God is in us, that God is our friend, and we are friends with God. I know. Sometimes people think that I'm frivolous at times. Other times people think I'm formal. Some people think I'm caring. Some people think I'm 
too serious. I mean, there's always this balance of different people's perspective about who I am. But the one thing I like, you know, I guess more than anything else is God knows me. You know, I mean, my family didn't know me the way God knows me. And I'm so glad that he saw my heart and sees my heart in every situation, even when I didn't know me or my heart. He already knew what was inside me. And that makes me tender. That keeps me humble. It keeps me holy unto God himself. I guess if there's anything that I would share from Tozer teaching, it would be that intimacy thing to come to a place, keep going after it until you get to that place of having that intimacy with your Father in heaven. That God himself, though you may not be perfect like he is, and get to the place where he has so much and you have really so little, that you come to a place where you know him intimately, that you have that kind of relationship that you need to have in order to survive this world. Because without a relationship, your religion will fail you. Without this relationship intimately with your father, God, as you perceive him, will fail you because you'll change your image of God into something else. But if you have a relationship where it's kind of interactive, you'll begin to yield more and more of your life and let go of more and more of the things in your life to where it'll just be kind of simpler for you to deal with God on a one-to-one -one basis. And that's really all God ever wanted from us. It wasn't to be oh so holy, but to be oh so in love with and loved by Him. Yeah.